Hey everybody, what's going on? Tonight we have got an awesome show planned for you. I'm going to be talking about one of my favorite subjects and that is everything AR-15. We're going to dig through the entire rifle, the platform, the upper, the lower, everything involved with the AR-15 and really kind of break it down and give you guys some great information on what you need to be looking at and what you need to buy for your next AR-15 or to upgrade the one that you already currently own. Really excited about this show tonight. This is one that I've been wanting to do for quite a while and uh, got a lot of great information tonight. Just want to say thank you to everybody tonight that's able to make it live on the show. And for those of you that aren't able to make it live, I'll be glad for you to sit down and watch it and uh, enjoy the show afterward on the uh, the after show. But uh, first thing first, want to make sure to ask everyone, hey, if you would please hit that subscribe button down below. By subscribing to the channel, that really helps us to grow. It helps with our algorithm with YouTube and helps us to reach more people. So please, if you would, hit that subscribe button down below. For those of you that weren't able to catch the show earlier today, I was live with Sensible Prepper uh, from 12 o'clock to 1 o'clock. We had an outstanding, outstanding show. So for those of you that really like prepping stuff, the uh, Sensible Prepper channel is a great, great channel to check out. We we're talking about uh, some a lot of big things not to do as a new prepper and big mistakes that uh, the new preppers make. So if you get a chance, go back over and check out that show from earlier today over on Sensible Prepper Live. It was a tremendous, tremendous show. I really enjoyed it. Uh, it was a little late getting there. <laughs> got up this morning and got all my work and stuff done, packed up, got ready to head over and go and shoot the show with, uh, with Don. Got in the truck and the battery was dead. So I had to go and pick up a new battery this morning before I was able to make it over for the uh, for the show with him and put me a few minutes behind. But it's a great, great show. I hope you're able to make it over and check it out. So let's dig into AR-15s. 99% of the people, I would say 99.9% .9 of the people watching this show tonight is, are familiar with AR-15s, what they are, all right? It is the, it is the, the, the current, probably the most popular firearm in the United States as far as long guns are concerned. It's a, uh, a semi-automatic rifle, magazine fed, and it's based off of, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm suffering with our, with our Southern allergies here. They're, uh, they've got my sinuses all messed up. So I do apologize for that. But uh, the AR-15, it's based on the military, the M16, whatever revision we're up to now, A4, I think, or A5. Um, which is a select fire, uh, safe semi three round burst firearm. The civilian version is only available in semi-automatic, which honestly is fine. The entire time I was in the Marine Corps, other than some training, we never shot the M16. I'll, I'll date myself a little bit. The uh, M16 A1s and M16 A2s when I was in, uh, we never shot those on anything other than semi-automatic because we were focusing on aimed fire and not area fire. Um, it's a great weapons platform. It's been around since the 1960s. It's, it's had a lot of upgrades, a lot of revisions to the original A1 platform, uh, the original Armalite platform, uh, is, uh, with everything involved with it from the... Uh, the powder charge used to projectile weight, the twist on the barrels, everything has been upgraded on this firearm. It's kind of like, you know, comparing a AR-15 from today uh, to the 1960s AR-15 would really be like comparing a 1911 from today to the original 1911 back in 1911. Um, they're the only thing that the outside dimensions are basically the same. But everything else with these firearms have changed. All of, the, all of the internals, everything about them is completely different. The materials, the uh, metals that are used, everything is different. The, the powders are better. The projectiles are better. It's, a, it's, it's really comparing an old uh, M16A1 to today's AR-15s is truly like comparing apples to oranges. They are completely, completely different. So let's start digging into some details with the AR-15 platform. What you need to look for, what you need to consider when you're getting ready to buy your first AR-15, your next AR-15, or upgrading your current AR-15. We're going to start off with upper receivers. Upper receivers, there are 
there's really two different types of upper receivers that are available. You've got your mil spec uh, forged upper receivers, which are probably the standard that the majority of us use. And then you have billet upper receivers. The billet upper receivers are generally um, a different material. They're generally 7075 aluminum. Uh, some are 6061, but majority are 7075 aluminum. Um, they are a little bit thicker. They're a little bit heavier. Um, and most of your billet upper receivers are built to match a specific billet lower receiver, where your, your forged receivers are what you would see from the majority of your manufacturers. They're, they're your mil spec upper receiver, what you get from Anderson Manufacturing or Palmetto State Armory or uh, Aero Precision, Colt, any of those companies, they all use forged upper receivers. And the forgings come from one of just a few companies in the industry. I think there's only three or four forging companies in the industry that make forgings for everyone. So you can look at the uh, the key stamp on the side of the receiver. That kind of gives you an idea what forge it came from. Um, but really, other than that, most of your forged upper, I'm going to say all of your forged upper receivers are basically the same. There, there may be a thousandth difference or two thousandths difference, maybe uh, with the anodizer that they are using. Maybe the anodizer puts the coating on a little bit heavier and uh, you get a thicker anodizing. Some companies will, uh, will Cerakote the uppers and things like that. But most of your forged upper receivers are all going to be very similar, whether you're buying a $29 or $39 Anderson stripped upper or a Palmetto, Palmetto State Armory stripped upper. Um, or, you know, these are like, we'll say $25 to $50 uppers versus uh, like a BCM or Aero Precision that's $100, $120. Guys, they're all the same uppers, okay? You're, you're not gaining anything or losing anything by paying more for a forged upper. Save your money, spend it on other things, get a forged upper that is the most cost effective that you can get. Uh, I, I use Palmetto State Armory uppers on almost every single AR-15 that I build for myself and for my customers. They're great uppers, the tolerances are outstanding, and you can build a very, very accurate rifle with their uppers. And they're, they're under $50 in most cases for a stripped upper. So if you want to go out and spend your money on crazy wild expensive uppers, excuse me, you can, but the end of the day, you're really not gaining anything. <clears throat> There's some things you can do to, uh, to some of the uppers. You know, you might notice that the the barrel extension going into the upper is a little bit loose. You slide the upper onto the barrel extension and there's a little bit of play in between it. If there's play in between it, there's things you can do to tighten that play up. And that's one thing that I do recommend doing if you're building an accurate rifle is to eliminate all the play in between the upper and lower receiver. You can do that with some different chemical compounds. You can do that with shims. You know, it's just kind of whatever you decide that you want to do, depending on how much play there is in between the upper and lower receiver. If you measure 10 upper receivers from 10 different manufacturers, the tolerances are probably going to be less than a thousandth across the board with all of them. The big difference that, you, that you're seeing is the difference in the outside diameter of the barrel extension from different barrel manufacturers. Some barrel manufacturers have tighter tolerances on that that are much closer to the OD, or I'm sorry, much closer to the ID of the upper receiver, where some companies are just spitting these things out by the thousands uh, for production pieces, and they are much looser on their tolerances than, uh, than some of your higher end barrels. So just because you have a loose upper to lower doesn't mean you're not gonna have an accurate rifle. So you want to really kind of look at the, the barrel itself. And if you can get the information from the manufacturer that you're buying from, find out what the outside diameter is of the barrel extension so you can compare it to your upper receiver. But forged receivers, my personal favorite. Use them. Love them. Come to State Armory makes a great one. Not ripping for PSA. Um, but they make great stuff, guys. And, you know, they're direct consumer sales. So the prices are quite a bit lower than what you see from a lot of other companies that sell um, through tiered distribution centers. Like uh, they sell to distributors, wholesalers, 
and uh, then on to retailers and then on to the consumer like you. So PSA is uh, they are direct to consumer sales, which is why they are able to sell their products at a much, much lower price. Let's talk about lower receivers. This is where things really start to separate some, okay? You've got your You've got your forged lower receivers, which are what you would expect to buy if you bought a PSA, Anderson, Aero Precision. Tons of companies out there have their roll stamp on the side of forged lower receivers. And they're great receivers. If you're just looking for a low cost rifle that you're building, um, we'll call it a budget AR-15, forged lower receivers are probably what you're gonna be getting. Um, and they're great receivers. That's what our military uses. You know, I've used them for decades and they're, they're great, great utilitarian lower receivers. But there's a lot of things that a forged lower receiver is missing as far as, you know, br really bringing it into the 21st century. And this is where your billet lower receivers and your custom lower receivers really come into play. With your billet lower receivers, your custom lower receivers that you buy, you can get these that have uh, ambi controls, which for a lefty is very important. And, and honestly, even for right-handed people, being able to switch from strong side to weak side, all of your rifles, your semi-automatic rifles, and especially your AR-15s, should, should have ambi controls on them. The safety, the mag release, the bolt release, those all need to be ambi controls. If if I need to switch to weak side, which for me is my right hand, I need to be able to run all the controls with my eyes closed. I never have to feel for anything. I know exactly where it's at. If I'm shooting strong side for me, I need to be able to know immediately where those controls are and not fumble for anything. And a lot of your ambi lowers offer those features today. We've got a uh, review coming up in the next few weeks from a magazine company, which most of you are familiar with. They're called Lancer Systems. Lancer Systems, I've been involved with these guys for a decade and a half or more. But Lancer Systems makes a billet lower receiver that, in my opinion, is the best lower receiver ever developed for the AR platform. We're going to be doing an in-depth review on it, going over all of the features that it offers and comparing it to your forged lower receiver that is what the majority of us have in our safes today. And I'm going to show you guys some of the, uh, some of the benefits and some of the features that the receiver from Lancer Systems offer in an in a upcoming video. So stay tuned for that one. It should be out in the next couple of weeks. I've got the lowers on the way right now from Lancer. And uh, that, guys, I'm telling you, they are absolutely incredible. If you've ever used the Lancer Systems L5A1 magazines, their steel feed lips on their magazines are absolute rock stars, okay? Great, great magazines. Magpul makes great magazines, but if you're looking for a bulletproof magazine that will stand the test of time, durability, reliability, everything that you need out of a magazine, the Lancer L5 magazines are tremendous. Make sure you check those out. And they're available in lots of different colors. Uh, to fit everyone's needs under the rainbow. <laughs> but really looking forward to that video. That's going to be an outstanding one. Um, billet lowers, there's tons of billet lowers out there. Uh, lots of companies are offering them. Wilson Combat, a lot of other companies offer billet lowers. Um, some of them have some upgraded features. Some of them are still just, the majority of them are just single side controls like your regular ARs. They don't have the ambi controls on them. Um, but do a little research on your lower before you buy it. And honestly, if you're in the market for a lower right now today, hold off a couple of weeks on buying that lower until you get to see that review that I've got coming up on the Lancer lowers. Hand guards. <clears throat> this is probably, to me, one of the biggest things that guys overlook when it comes to an AR-15 platform. You've got your non-free float hand guards, which are... Uh, the mil spec hand guards, your Magpul hand guards, basically any hand guard that snaps into the delta ring on the rifle. And then you have your free float hand guards, and there's there's a metric ton of free float hand guards that are out there. Lots of different companies make them. Lots of different companies offer them. Uh, so let let's address non free float hand guards first and foremost. 
So the non-free float handguards, most of them are plastic. Uh, there are some aluminum options out there that do fit the uh, the key mod handguard or do fit the uh, the delta ring on the rifles, but the majority of them are plastic. <clears throat> Your uh, non-free float handguards do not isolate the barrel from the handguard. And, and for me, especially coming from the Marine Corps, from competitive shooting, three gun, precision rifle stuff, a rifle has to have a free float handguard. And the reason for that is a non-free float handguard introduces stress and changes the harmonics of a barrel. So any kind of stress you put on that handguard, whether it's a bipod, whether it's a sling, even your hand bracing against things, you can change the point of impact of that rifle from 100 yards and out. And I, I don't like that. I like to be able to brace up, shoot any way that I want to without changing the point of impact on my rifle. And I can't do that with a non-free float handguard. So if you've got a rifle, has a free float handguard on it, maybe you bought a budget rifle, and it's got one of the plastic Magpul handguards on it, whatever, really consider replacing that handguard with a free float handguard just to isolate the barrel. It's going to make your rifle more accurate only by replacing the handguard because you're reducing and almost eliminating all the stressors that you can, that you can introduce to that barrel. So really consider doing a... Uh, a free float handguard on your rifle. Now let's dig into free floats. All right, free, free floats are, they've been around for you know, 20, 30 years, maybe a little more. Um, back 20 or 30 years ago, it was basically just a tube that uh, screwed onto the, the barrel and that was it. You know, things have come a long way since, uh, you know, 2005, a long, long way. You know, today we've got key mod handguards, we've got M-lock handguards, we've got quad rails, we have still just round handguards with slots in it that you can mount rails anywhere you want. Um, there, there's a lot of different handguard options. Probably the most popular, the two most popular today are going to be the M-Lock, uh, which was originally developed by Magpul, and then you have the KeyMod handguards. Uh, KeyMod was the thing to use a few years ago. Everybody was doing KeyMod. KeyMod was awesome. Uh, Magpul came out with the M-Lock system, and M-Lock almost immediately eclipsed KeyMod as far as uh, parts and accessories that you could buy to adapt to your handguard. So if, if I was looking at a new handguard today, it would be an M-Lock handguard. I've got a bunch of KeyMods in the safe, uh, stuff that I've had for a long time that works, and it works exceptionally well. Um, but right now, if I was building a rifle today, it would be an M-Lock handguard just because of the aftermarket support as far as accessories that I can buy that clip directly into the M-Lock on the handguard. The next big thing to consider is the length of the handguard. You know, a lot of you have got, you know, 14.5 or 16-inch rifle with uh, your non-free float handguard. You've got a Magpul handguard on it or whatever, and your handguard is probably 7 inches long. That seven inch long handguard either ends at the gas block or at your front sight base. I much prefer a longer handguard. You know, for me, I'm I'm a big guy. I'm 6'4, 250 pounds, and I've got I've got monkey arms. You know, there's just no way around it. I'm I'm a I'm a full grown man. Okay. But <laughs> I like a longer handguard. I, I like a shorter barrel, but I like a longer handguard. So I normally run a 15 inch handguard so I can get out more toward the end of the handguard, which looks weird to some people, but a 15 inch handguard with my arm out toward the end is a comfortable rifle shooting position for me. It's about the same position that I would be on a bolt gun um, or any other type of rifle. So being able to run a longer handguard on the rifle, it gives you a more comfortable position to be able to put your arm. It also gives you more space if you want to mount a bipod, if you want to mount a sling, uh, if you want to mount weapon lights. It gives you more. It gives you more space on that handguard to be able to mount different accessories. Um, to me, one of the big things, one of the big no-nos for me personally, is adding a lot of excess weight to my rifle. You know, you can add, uh, like I said, the bipods. You can add slings. You can add sling swivels. Uh, you can add D-balls uh, for your for your laser designators. There's lots of different things. People add flashlights and all kind of stuff to their rifles. 
I try and keep my rifle as light as I can possibly get it from the gas block forward. And the reason for that is that is all transitional weight. So the more weight you have out on the handguard, the slower you're going to be transitioning from target to target. So I always try and minimize the weight on my rifle. Or if I do have to add accessories, I add my accessories back toward the center of gravity on the rifle, which is about where the mag well is or just around that area. Um, to try and minimize any type of forward weight on the rifle, it makes it much faster to shoot, much faster to transition. The next big thing we're going to talk about are triggers. And everyone has an opinion on triggers. Uh, I'm going to give you guys some facts about triggers. There, we've got a few different triggers we're going to talk about. Uh, first is going to be our mil spec trigger. This is generally what you get when you buy your, your basic budget rifle. It's going to have a mil spec style trigger or an enhanced mil spec trigger in it. Generally, the mil spec triggers, they are a single stage trigger with a lot of creep. So basically, when you pull the trigger, the trigger feels like it's jerking across something while you're pulling it. Think about taking a pencil eraser and pulling it across a piece of sandpaper. That gritty feel that you feel as you're dragging the, the pencil eraser across sandpaper, that's kind of what your enhanced or your mil spec triggers are going to feel like. The pull weight on those averages anywhere from five and a half to about nine pounds, which to me, it's difficult to shoot a rifle extremely accurate or fast with a heavy trigger pull. You know, I don't want my trigger pull to be more than the weight of my rifle. If I've got a five and a half pound rifle and I've got a five and a half pound trigger, there's almost no way that I can pull the trigger on that rifle without disturbing the sights on the rifle. So for me personally, two pounds, two and a half pounds is as heavy as I want on any of my rifles. I love single stage triggers. I've always been a single stage trigger fan. Um, I don't like staging the trigger like you would with a two-stage trigger, and we're going to talk about those in just a minute. Um, but me personally, I prefer a single-stage trigger. I want to put my finger on it, apply a little bit of pressure, and the shot breaks. A two-stage trigger is much different than that. A two-stage trigger, you have pre-travel, which is generally um, three to four pounds of pull, and then the trigger hits a solid wall. It'll stop. And then your trigger pull weight is about a pound more on the wall to the break. So if you've got a, a three and a half pound trigger pull on the first stage, you'll have another pound on the second stage, which is gonna give you about a four and a half pound trigger pull. <coughs> Single, uh, two stage triggers are, I think they really do have a place and some people are very, um, they're very attached to their two stage triggers. They use two stage trigger in their, in their uh, bolt guns or their precision rifles in their ARs, everything. I've just never been a fan of them. So for me, it's a single stage trigger. I love the single stage triggers. There's a lot of great two stage triggers on the market. Um, and if, if that's your flavor, that's, that's great. Um, but my suggestion would be if you're not familiar with a good single stage trigger, you're not familiar with a good two stage trigger, go to a, a gun shop that has both and try them both and see which one you prefer. Um, like I said, for me, the single stage is a way to go. Um, a lot of great companies out there that make them. Uh, CMC Triggers does a great single stage and a great two stage trigger. Uh, there's a lot of guys that use the Gazzly stuff. Um, some people pronounce it Gazelle, Gazzly. It's uh, the, the proper pronunciation for it is Gazzly. Uh, Gazzly makes a great trigger. They're expensive, but they, they work and they work well. Uh, but Gasly and CMC are probably my two my two top picks. Uh, with CMC being a personal favorite, because I really really like their flat triggers. You know, and that's one more consideration: is do you want a curved trigger or a flat trigger? If you have big hands like I do, the flat trigger positions your finger at more of a ninety degree angle to uh, from the grip to the trigger shoe, and I'm able to shoot it faster and more accurately than I can a curved trigger. Curved trigger puts my index finger kind of pointed back to me and moves the trigger to the rear more. So smaller hands, I'd recommend a curved trigger. Larger hands, I'd recommend a flat trigger. Uh, but once again, try it and see what you think. See what works best for you. It's uh, getting ready to roll into number five. Let's jump over here and look at a few questions that we've got from tonight, and then we'll jump back into our list. 
Uh, a lot of guys on here saying hello tonight. Uh, Chris Matthews says, hello everyone. Robbie, how's the garden going? Chris, the garden is going great. We, uh, we just got our new blueberry patch put in and uh, worked several days on that. The blueberry patch is amazing. The, blueberry, the blueberries in the patch have hundreds and hundreds of, of berries on them already. So we should have a really, really good blueberry harvest this year. Uh, the regular garden itself, we've still got our early season crops in, which we're going to be swapping over in the next few weeks. But the early season stuff that we have in right now is doing really well. Luckily, the, uh, we've had some cold weather. The insects haven't been a big issue uh, yet, but the garden is doing really well. Thanks for asking, Chris. Uh, Justin Hopkins says, what are the benefits to each barrel twist and grain ammo? Example, one in eight shoots 77 better than 55, so they say. Justin, this is going to be one that we're going to get into uh, quite a bit as we go down through the list. So if you would just stay with us and I will answer your questions on barrel twist and projectile weight. Uh, Richard Cranium, hey Robbie, Dwayne Booth, Anderson County, Tomcat941, good evening, Jim Griner, hey everybody, uh, Michael Avens, hello everyone, Kevin Ramsey, hey Jim and Michael, uh, Chris Matthews says, Robbie, are there any recommendations for free float rails for taking heavy abuse if ever dropped, etc.? I've been told the A2 front sight post holds up well to abuse. Uh, Chris, I will give you a personal recommendation from... A friend of mine. I had a, uh, a really good friend in Special Forces a few years ago. He was deployed to uh, either Iraq or Afghanistan. I don't remember which. Uh, but he jumped over a collot wall and landed on a tank mine. And the tank mine detonated when he landed on it. And uh, his optic survived and his handguard survived. Um, and he was using a uh, IO... IOR Valdata rifle scope one by ten and his rifle scope survived. Um, it actually was still zeroed when it got back home. And the free float handguard, he had a uh, I believe he had a BCM handguard on his rifle, one of the key mods, and his handguard survived as well. Uh, being hit with a tank mine, you know, it was right over the top of it. Uh, my friend survived as well. Uh, he had some pretty substantial injuries that uh that he'll carry with him the rest of his life but but he did survive the uh the blast but they're the majority i'm telling you guys the majority of the free float handguards that are out there dropping it banging it against something is not going to disrupt the your zero on your rifle um if you get a handguard from a reputable manufacturer here in the united states that handguard's going to work it's going to survive so you know, if, if these things will hold up to a, a tank mine blast, they're going to hold up to pretty much anything that any of us would ever do to it, short of running over it with a car. Uh, the thin aluminum on the tubes laying sideways, if you run over it with a car, is going to crush it, okay? It just, it just is what it is. And, and really, it wouldn't matter if it was a quarter-inch thick 7075 aluminum. If you drove over it with a car, it's still probably going to crush it. So I like a thin, lightweight handguard that has accessory rails on it and a pick rail on the top, the full length of the top. But find a rail that you like. Don't worry about uh, banging it against something or whatever, or dropping it and bending it. It's not going to happen. These handguards are very robust that are on the market today. Uh, Don Filkin says, hey, Rob, Eclipse is come and gone, and we are all still here, LOL. Got pretty dark here in New Hampshire. Traffic was bumper to bumper heading north into Vermont. Sounds like a great show coming up. Don, good to have you on tonight, bud. Yep, we, uh, just like Y2K, we all survived the eclipse. It's amazing. I, I, I wasn't sure. I didn't know if it was going to happen or not. You know, we had an eclipse here in uh, South Carolina a few years ago. We had a total eclipse, and uh, it was pretty cool. You know, everything got dark, and it cooled off some. Uh, <laughs> but this is the, the third eclipse that I've been through in my life, and uh, luckily, I've survived all three. You know, if we get to catch another one, maybe I'll survive that one too. But uh I always think it's interesting to look at some of the comments that people are posting online and, and different threads and stuff about the, about eclipses and, you know, how it's the end of the world, you know, it's, it's whatever, you know, the, the world is going to end, you know, in, in 12 hours. And I just, I, I think it's, I think it's kind of humorous. Um, but yeah, we, we all survived. Glad you all survived and were able to make it tonight. We're going to have a, 
some great conversations. Uh, Bell Cool Mountain says, I'm getting over a bad sinus infection. Um, no sinus infection for me. I am getting over a, a really terrible case of poison oak right now, though. My uh, my wife and I, we love to work outside in the yard, and I got uh, I got ate up with poison oak about a week ago. So I'm just getting over that as well. Uh, Chris Matthews, moderate heavy use round count nitride versus cold hammer forged. Chris, I'm on, before I go any further, I'm going to go ahead and cover this one. Guys, from what I've seen, um, Cold Hammer Forged is the best for heavy use. Um, but with that being said, nitrided barrels are right behind Cold Hammer Forged barrels. Uh, and nitrided barrels, my opinion, from a lot of testing that I've done with both Cold Hammer Forged and nitrided barrels, nitrided barrels are more accurate from the beginning of the barrel all the way through the end of the barrel's life. Nitrided barrels are more accurate than cold hammer forged barrels. Cold hammer forged barrels have their place. Um, they work, they work exceptionally well. And I shot them for years when I was shooting competitively and never felt like I was giving anything up to any of my competitors using a cold hammer forged barrel. Um, but with that being said, if, if I was building a new rifle today for competitive shooting or defensive use, and I was looking at building a, a really hard use rifle, I'd probably lean more toward the nitrided barrels over the cold hammer forged, just because of the enhanced accuracy across the board with all projectile weights that you get with the nitrided barrels over the cold hammer forged barrels. Uh, Gen X Prepper says late but made it. Hello from Maryland. Your next prepper, good to have you here tonight. Uh, John Richardson says, uh, Gasly SSP M4 curved bow. Yep, the Gasly uh, SSP is a great, great trigger, guys. Great trigger. And, uh, and John also says, uh, Trigger Tech adaptable for two stage. You know, I've, I've played with a lot of the Trigger Tech stuff, and the Trigger Tech triggers are really good in gas guns like AR-15s as well as bolt guns. Um, but there's some other stuff out there that I prefer over the, uh, over the trigger techs, especially for the, uh, for the AR platform. Boxer Papa says hello from Central Florida. Boxer Popper, good to have you on tonight. Uh, James Trump 24 Price, hello from Sevierville, Tennessee. James, I was just up your way this past week. We took, uh, my boys and eight of their friends to, uh, up to Sevierville for the week for uh, spring break. So we spent a week up there having a good time hiking and stuff. But it's a beautiful, beautiful country up there. I love that area. Uh, let's see. Uh, Boxer Papa says, Robbie, IOR, Valdata, Optics, and Trijicon ACOGs are my top choices. I tell you that. The IOR Valdata is, it's a heavy optic. But guys, if you're looking for an end of the world scope that will survive, the Valdata is the way to go. I don't think there's a better scope on the market today at any price. Those are tremendous, tremendous optics. Uh, Tomcat941 says, what twist rate do you prefer? And uh, we'll go ahead and cover that one right quick as well. Uh, twist rate is really dependent on the projectile weight that you're going to shoot, your bullet weight, and also how far you plan on shooting. So most of your uh, commercial rifles, if you're buying a Smith & Wesson MMP or Ruger or whatever, most of those rifles are going to come with a 1 in 9 twist barrel. 1 in 9 twist works really well with projectile weights up to 60 grains, 62 grains. Um, if you're just looking for a plinking rifle, 1 in 9 is fine. Um, me personally, I prefer a one in eight twist barrel. It'll shoot 40 grain to 80 grain projectiles extremely accurately. Um, the barrel steel that they use on most of your one in eight twist barrels is either going to be a stainless steel barrel or it's going to be a, uh, a carbon barrel that's nitrided. But for me personally, one in eight twist is my, it's my personal favorite. <coughs> A one in seven would be my second choice. One in seven will stabilize uh, 90 grain projectiles. The only downside with your heavier stuff, you get over 77 grains and you can't 
uh, load those into your magazine. They have to be single loaded into the rifle. So for me, going with a one in seven twist, I'm not single loading my rifle, especially an AR-15. Um, a lot of guys that shoot like an NRA service rifle and some things like that, they'll single load their heavy bullets to be more accurate at 500 yards, 600 yards um, with a heavier projectile. But me personally, I cap everything at 77 grains. That's as heavy as I put in my rifles because I can load those to magazine length and they work well. And uh, I strongly prefer a one in eight twist barrel over the one in sevens. Um, but if you're looking for a cold hammer forged barrel, if that's your, if that's your flavor, uh, the cold hammer forged barrels, you're going to be stuck with a one in seven. I don't think anyone in the industry makes a, a one in eight twist cold hammer forged barrel, but one in seven works extremely well as well. Um, you just narrow your projectile weight that you can use. Uh, 52 to 55 grain is like your, your lowest uh, projectile weight that you can use, but you can go higher uh, up to, like I said, the 80 or 90 grain projectiles where a one in eight will allow you to use anything from 40 grains up to 80 grains and stabilize it extremely well. Uh, Russ Michael says, hey, Robbie, uh, Eclipse Day was my lucky day. Just happened to walk into my local shop. Uh, lo and behold, they had a new Marlin 94 in 357.38. It went home with me. You got a deal. Uh, hopefully it was a JM stamped barrel. The JM stamped Marlins are tremendously accurate rifles. Uh, very easy to work on, but those are, those are some of my favorite lever guns. You don't see them very often anymore, but uh, great, great guns. Uh, Semper Gumby's on here tonight. My buddy Semper Gumby, if you haven't checked out his YouTube channel, he has a great, great outdoor YouTube channel. Uh, so check him out, Semper Gumby. Uh, good to have you on here tonight, Ben. Uh, he said, I'm back from traveling, but leave for the more Expo next week on Storytellers Row in Springfield, Missouri. Hey guys, make sure you check out his channel. Ben's got an absolutely amazing channel. I love his stuff. All right, and we've kind of worked through our comments. Let's jump back over here into our list. Uh, upper and lower parts kits. Uh, this is one that's kind of all over the board. There's a lot of different options with them. Me personally, I lean more toward the mil spec upper and lower parts kits. Uh, it's just pins and springs and stuff that that allow your lower to function properly. You know, give you your forward assist on the upper, uh, your dust cover and things like that. Especially with the lower receivers, I like the lower, the mil spec lower parts kits. I think the uh, the pin diameters generally fit really well. I'm not a big fan of oversized pins anymore. I don't, uh, you know, I, I've ran some in the past, but I've I've found that in some cases, uh, the oversized pins get in the way of the safety. Um, so you can hit the thumb safety when you go to take the safety on or put the safety off with some of the oversized pins that are out there. So I lean more toward just the standard length pins. Um, and then with your controls, there's a lot of different controls and we'll get into those later. But I, I generally lean toward mil spec upper and lower parts kits when it comes to, uh, to assembling a lower receiver. Muzzle devices. Now this is a big one. Uh, Two different things you have as far as muzzle devices are flash hiders and muzzle brakes. And they do two completely different jobs. A flash hider is designed to minimize the muzzle flash of the rifle, where a muzzle brake is designed to redirect the gas coming out of the barrel to help reduce the recoil and muzzle rise of the rifle. The biggest consideration that you have to make as a user is what are you trying to do with your rifle? If you're trying to minimize flash, then the flash hider is going to be the way to go. If you're trying to reduce recoil and muzzle rise, you're going to lean more toward the muzzle brake. And then the next option that you have is, is the device suppressor capable or suppressor adaptable? Most of your suppressor companies that are out there, um, they offer muzzle brakes and flash hiders that will quick detach with their suppressor or silencer. So if you're looking at doing a suppressor down the road and you want to be able to use it on the rifle that you're building or the rifle that you have, make sure that you get a muzzle device that will work with the suppressor that you're considering getting down the road. If I'm going to be running, I don't run flash hiders on anything. Um, it's just me. I'm not trying to hide the flash on my rifle. I want my rifle to be 
as fast and flat and accurate as I can possibly get it. So I run muzzle brakes on everything. Um, if I'm building a rifle that is designed specifically for suppressed use, I'm going to put a muzzle brake on there that will work with whatever suppressor I'm going to use. And the reason I use a muzzle brake on an AR-15 versus a flash hider or direct thread is the muzzle brake becomes your primary blast baffle. So as the gas and the projectile exit the muzzle, it's going to hit that muzzle brake and redirect a lot of that gas away from the primary blast baffle in the suppressor, which is going to allow your suppressor to last much longer. The muzzle brake is going to be your consumable first blast baffle in your suppressor. You burn the muzzle brake up, you take the muzzle brake off and swap it, put another muzzle brake on, and go right back to shooting. But you're not burning up your suppressor. So if you're going to run a can, I would strongly recommend going with a muzzle brake over direct thread or a flash hider, just because it will allow your suppressor to last much, much longer. Now, now we're going to get into some personal preference items. Butt stocks. Lots of options when it comes to butt stocks. Do I want a fixed butt stock? Which... I like fixed butt stocks. I'm, I'm a big tall guy and the longer length with a fixed butt stock generally fits me very well. But I do have quite a few AR-15s with collapsible butt stocks on them as well because they're, they're built for different purposes. Whether it's, you know, my truck gun or whatever, it's going to have a collapsible stock on it so I can make it as small as possible when it's in the vehicle. But the two options you have are fixed or adjustable. And, and that's going to be a big thing that you're going to want to look at when you're building a rifle is what's the end use? Am I building a DMR, designated marksman rifle? Uh, if that's the case, you're probably going to want a fixed butt stock that's got some weight to it, maybe an adjustable comb, adjustable length of pull. Um, that's going to allow you to really dial that rifle in and set that rifle up for making uh, intermediate shots, you know, out to 600 yards in the most, in the fastest, most expeditious, comfortable way you can do it. Um, you can do that with a collapsible butt stock, but the collapsible stock is really designed more for um, minimizing the footprint of the rifle itself. There's some great stocks out there. There's a company, uh, Mission First Tactical, that makes a butt stock called the Minimalist. And for a collapsible butt stock, it is my favorite by far. It uh, just looks like a little L shaped stock. It's got a a little angled foot at the bottom of it so if i've got a plate carrier on it doesn't hang up on my plate carrier when i'm coming off my shoulder uh, but a lot of neat features with that stock it's it's like i said it's by far my favorite for uh for collapsible stock rifles another big consideration if you're doing a collapsible stock is mil spec versus commercial tube um, your buffer tube on your rifle comes in one of two configurations either mil spec or commercial um, a commercial tube will, or commercial buttstock will fit on a mil spec tube. It's just going to be sloppy and loose. A mil spec buttstock will not fit on a commercial tube. The dimensions are different on it. It's larger in a couple of areas. There's a radius from the uh, the rib on the bottom. It kind of comes up into a radius like this instead of coming up into a hard angle and then going out into the tube. And the mil spec buttstock will not work on a commercial tube. So. If you've got a rifle at home, you're looking at upgrading your butt stock on it, make sure you take the stock off and look at the buffer tube before you place your order so you know you're getting either a you know you need to order a commercial buffer tube or a mil spec buffer tube. And there's there's both of them out there. There's companies that use both on their rifles. Uh, I think it's really a lot of times just depending on what's available at the time when they're building their rifles. Uh, so make sure you look at that before you order a new butt stock for your rifle and make sure that that uh that you know what type of tube you have on it. The next one is another really personal one, is uh, grips. Everybody has their own personal flavor of grip that fits their hand. Um, there's a lot of different grip angles that are available from a really steep angle to almost a straight up and down angle. Um, Magpul makes some awesome grips. My personal favorites are made by a company called Ergo. Uh, it's E-R-G-O. I love the Ergo grips. I've been using them for a decade and a half now or more but then you have diameters that you have to look at do you want a larger diameter grip for big hands do you want a smaller diameter grip for smaller hands do you want a grip that has a thumb shelf on it on one side a thumb shelf on both sides do you want a palm swell on the grip 
Um, and then what angle do you want on the grip? Do you want the grip to be rubberized and kind of soft? Do you want it to be a hard plastic grip? Do you want it to have storage compartments in the bottom of it? Uh, so lots of options when it comes to grips. And it's one of those things, they're kind of like holsters for a pistol. If you've got a local gun shop that has an assortment of grips, I'd highly recommend going in and trying some different grips on rifles and see which one positions your hand the best for, uh, for your finger on the trigger. You know, I'll, and I'll give you a perfect example of that. The, uh, the OEM mil spec black grip that comes on all of your, 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 I would say the majority of your ARs that you buy today. For me, that grip angle is too steep and it doesn't position my wrist or my trigger finger properly on the trigger. I end up with my bottom two fingers end up not even squeezing the grip because it kicks my wrist and hand at such an angle that it's not comfortable or fast for me to shoot that rifle with the angle that that grip is. But I run a, a grip on my rifles that's more straight up and down because it positions my wrist and my trigger finger at a more natural angle to the trigger itself. But try some out and see what fits best for you. Now let's talk about barrels. Barrels are one of those things that, you know, there, there's a ton of different stuff out there. We were talking earlier about the twist rate of the barrel. Uh, projectile weights and uh, overall barrel length. You know, for me, a 14.5 or a 16 inch barrel will allow you to take advantage of almost everything that the 5.56 cartridge is capable of doing. Um, my my personal my EDC rifle that is is one of my one of my go to rifles has a 16 inch barrel, has a muzzle brake on it. It's a one in eight twist. Um, I ended up going with a stainless steel barrel just because they weren't available at the time uh, in a black nitride option. Um, I'm a huge fan of Criterion rifle barrels. I think Criterion makes some of the most accurate AR barrels on the market, if not the most accurate AR barrels on the market. And uh, all of my go-to rifles have Criterion barrels in them. Uh, I've used barrels from a ton of manufacturers. Ballistic Advantage is a great one, or Aero Precision, they're the same company. Uh, the Ballistic Advantage barrels are great. Um, but I've had better results with the Criterion barrels than I have with anything else that I've used, uh, with the exception of one company and they're not in business anymore. And I think the majority of the people that work there are all in jail now. Uh, and that was Sabre Defense. But if you've, if you've ever owned a Sabre Defense barrel back in the day, the Sabre Defense AR barrels were second to none. Absolutely incredible barrels. But I put the Criterion barrels on par with the, uh, with the Sabre Defense barrels from uh, back in the early 2000s. So if you're looking at a new barrel, I highly, highly recommend uh, considering the, the Criterion barrels. They are outstanding. One and eight twist, 16 inch, mid-length gas. Um, the mid-length gas gives you a little softer recoil impulse. So I, I tend to lean toward the, anything that's gonna help reduce recoil on the rifle. Um, mid-length over carbine, especially in a 5.56, mid-length is going to give you a softer recoil impulse. If you're going to an 18-inch, go with a rifle length. <coughs> that rifle length gas tube is going to help soften the recoil impulse even more uh, with a couple of inches added to your barrel and still give you the dwell time that you need uh, from the gas port to the end of the muzzle for the rifle to function properly. The, uh, we talked about projectile weights with our barrels a little bit earlier. Uh, one in eight twist works really well with a 40 to 80 grain projectiles. Uh, the heaviest you can load in a 5.56 magazine length is going to be 77 grains. Um, so you know, the one in eight twist works, it, it falls right in that window and shoots those projectiles extremely accurately. Uh, so one in eight twist is, is definitely my, uh, my go-to. Um, one in sevens work just as well. It uh, it just limits you on your lighter weight projectiles. You're limited to like 50 to 52 grain projectiles as far as being able to uh, stabilize it without overspinning the projectile. So one in eight, way to go. 16 inches is, in my opinion, you know, is a is a great um, a great barrel length that you're not compromising much on accuracy or velocity. Uh, but then you're also saving some weight on the end of the barrel as far as the transitions from target to target with, with a little lighter barrel. And then uh, 
let's talk about we were talking about buffer assemblies earlier let's uh let's talk about buffer weight a little bit and this is a big one there's uh especially with your carbine length systems there's uh different spring weights you can get you can get a uh, heavy springs that have more spring weight you can get lighter springs that have lighter spring weight and then you have your buffers and the buffer itself really will allow you to tune the rifle um, and either increase or decrease the chamber dwell time before the rifle starts to unlock. Um, you've got your H1 buffers, which have just some steel in them and then rubber, rubber uh, washers in between the weights, all the way to your tungsten buffers, uh, and even all stainless steel or even all tungsten buffers. Uh, so you can go from like a three ounce buffer all the way up to like a nine, 10, 11, 12 ounce buffer. And it's really just finding that that balance that you're looking for with the weight of the buffer, uh, the weight of your bolt carrier group, the weight of your recoil spring, and maximizing that system to help minimize recoil. Uh, most guys will run an H3 or an H4 on your uh, on your buffer in your carbon link systems with a standard recoil spring. And for most people, unless you're really trying to dial it in for a specific purpose, that setup works really, really well. And uh, number 10 on the list is mandatory controls. And first thing I have on my list for mandatory controls are your thumb safety. I'm, I'm a big fan of ambi controls like I've talked about before. Um, I think you should be able to manip manipulate the rifle from your right hand or your left hand. Either way, if I'm shooting right handed, I want to be able to manipulate all my controls and everything's in a certain place. Left handed, the exact same way. My ambi safety allows me to take the safety off with my thumb and allows me to come off of the trigger and swipe the safety back on when I come off of the trigger. So, and it doesn't matter if you use a, I prefer a 90 degree safety. A lot of guys like 45 degree safeties. Uh, the 90 degree safety for me, when I come off of the trigger, my index finger is lined up perfectly with a 90 degree safety. And it's very easy for me to pull the safety basically with my trigger finger back into the own position where a 45 degree safety, I have to come off of it and kind of lift my finger up to put the safety on. So I like 90 degree safeties. A lot of guys like 45s, personal preference, just like grips and butt stocks. You know, it's what, what flavor fits you the best. Um, the next, the next uh, thing we're going to talk about are bolt releases. Bolt releases, um, I like a bolt release that's on both sides of the gun. I like ambi controls. Um, and I want my bolt release to be able to, I want to be able to use it if I'm right-handed with my index finger on the right side of the rifle. Or if I'm left-handed, I want to be able to use it on the left side of the rifle. You can use standard bolt releases. You can use oversized bolt releases that make it easier to get to with your finger. Um, and then on the right side of the rifle, you're, if the rifle is not an ambi, ambi rifle, you're either going to have to mill the receiver to add a bolt release to it, uh, or you're going to have to add one of the, like the Magpul, Magpul bad levers or something like that that extends out into the trigger guard. One thing to consider when you're adding any type of lever is that lever is adding uh, a pivot weight and it can cause your bolt not to lock to the rear, or it can cause your bolt to inadvertently fall without hitting the lever. I've seen this with a lot of different guys' rifles over the years. They go to do a mag change from a bolt lock. They go to slam the magazine in, and the bolt falls before the magazine's seated. And they end up having to charge the rifle once they get the magazine seated because the uh, the bad lever from whatever company they were using was too heavy and caused some, some weight and the bolt became dislodged and fell. So I prefer an ambi. Ambi controls on mine on the lower receiver itself, but if you've got a mil spec lower and you're looking at doing a uh, ambi bolt release on it, consider having your receiver milled to add that bolt release to it. There's some great bolt releases that are out there that you can, if you take your time, you can do it with a Dremel at home, uh, or you can send it to Wheaton Arms and we can mill your receiver for you. But uh, it's a great added feature to your rifle and one that I highly recommend. And then the next one is magazine releases. And the options you have with the magazine releases are your, your OEM mag release, your extended mag releases, oversized magazine releases, and then AMBI magazine releases. Once again, I always go with the AMBI. Um, 
the right side of my rifle, I'll leave it the standard OEM mil spec. I've got big hands, big fingers. It's easy for me to get to that mag release on the right side. On the left side of the rifle, I use a uh, I use an aftermarket company. I'll use, either use Norgon or uh, or uh, Troy Industries for my my magazine release on the left side of the rifle. I like the Troy release. It has a little paddle that it just lines up perfectly with my finger and it is very intuitive for me to hit that magazine release uh, from Troy. The Norgon release works really well as well, but it just fits in the, uh, the OEM footprint for the magazine release on the left side of the receiver. So that's, that's another one to consider. Guys, like I was talking about earlier, I've got a video coming up in the next couple of weeks from, uh, on lower receivers from a company called Lancer Systems. I've been using their lowers for 15 plus years, maybe going on 20 years now. They are absolutely outstanding. And I really wanted to highlight their receivers for you guys and show you some of the benefits and features that the receivers from Lancer Systems offer over your mil spec receivers that a lot of us use today. That video is coming up in a couple of weeks. Let's uh, jump back over here. We're gonna go through a few questions right quick and, uh, and then we'll get ready to sign off. <clears throat> uh, Skull says, I agree with bullet weight. I just stick with 69 grain CR Match Kings. And, and I tell you, that is the 69 grain CR Match King or the 68 grain hollow point boat tail from uh, Hornady are two of my personal favorites. I've used those for decades now. And they are tremendous, tremendous bullets, especially in a one in seven or a one in eight twist barrel. Some of your one in nine twist barrels will stabilize them. Some of them won't. Um, and that was really one of the reasons I got away from one in nine twist barrels is back in the day I was shooting some uh, NRA service rifle stuff and my rifle just did not like 69 grain bullets. And, uh, you know, you really need the heavier bullet for shooting the, uh, the long range portion of the, of the course. And my rifle didn't like 69. So I, I ended up going away from the one in nine twist way back then. And, uh, I think then I went to a one in seven because one in eights weren't really popular. But uh, one in eight with 69s or one in seven with 69s is a is a great, great combination. Uh, John Richardson says, should lower parts kits with, with uh, MEM parts be used for serious use rifles? John, I try not to use MEM parts on anything. Um, MEM parts are, are a failure point in my opinion, and I tend to stay away from them. I'll use, uh, I try and use machine parts whether it's the, uh, my pins or whatever, I, I try and always use machined parts and uh, stay away from the MIM stuff. Uh, Russ Michael says, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, no, Robbie, this is the new Ruger made Marlin. Uh, I do have JM stamp Marlin text and I bought in 76. It's a 30, 30. Uh, Russ, I would send me some pictures of your new rifle, bud. I'd love to be able to see it and check it out. I, uh, I played with a bunch of the uh, the new Marlins made by Ruger, but I have not had a chance to play with one of their uh, 38357, so I'd love to check it out. Uh, Bell Cool Mountain says, there's only one health benefit I know of with tobacco use. Tobacco users do not get Parkinson's disease. It's a good point. I've never heard that before. Uh, Andrew Valenta says, the Ruger AR556 I own is one in eight, and Ruger claims it's cold hammer forged. Interesting. Um, most of the Rugers that I've shot had a one in nine twist barrel. I don't think that I've used one of their, uh, one of their new rifles with a one in eight twist cold hammer forest barrels. I'll have to check that out. And Chris Matthews says, what is the preferred buffer for mid length? Uh, Chris, I like a, uh, I like a H3 or an H4 buffer with a standard weight recoil spring in the, uh, with a mid length gas system. I, I think it shoots very soft. It's very flat shooting. Um, I've tried some heavier weight buffers in them and didn't, the recoil impulse to me felt kind of sluggish, uh, almost spongy feeling. Um, so the H2 or the H3 or the H4, any of those will work. Um, if I was going to buy one today, I'd probably buy an H3. It falls right in the middle, gives a great feeling recoil impulse without making the rifle feel spongy. And, uh, Russ Michael says 10 for Robbie. Appreciate it, bud. Thank you all for watching tonight. Guys, I really enjoyed this show, and I want to say I appreciate all of you for hanging in there, hanging in there and watching the show tonight. 
If you would, once again, please make sure you hit that subscribe button down below. It helps with the algorithm with, uh, with YouTube and helps us to reach more people. Now, once again, thank you all for watching. God bless everybody. I'll see you next Tuesday.